Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this video on Ages of Empires. This is the first episode of this brand new series where we will be covering all of the major empires starting from this, the old kingdom of Egypt, all the way up to the present time. So this is perhaps going to be the longest series, however, since each empire is really quite different. I hope it continues to be interesting throughout. And of course, these do not need to be watched in order. If you have a particular interest in a certain empire or a certain comparison, please feel free to focus on those. Furthermore, there's two major inspirations I'd like to reference in terms of this series. Firstly, that being Plutarch's Lives. I don't have that copy with me. That's back in British Columbia. I am now in Nova Scotia, however, in terms of each of Plutarch's parallel lives, he takes an ancient Greek and an ancient Roman live, and then he creates a comparison at the end to learn a little bit about both of those. So we will take a leader from each of the respective empires and then have a comparison between the two. And we kind of, I kind of focused on the major leaders of each because you can only pick. In some empires, there's sort of one dominant leaders, but many have many different leaders throughout the course of the empire. So I've kind of had to deduce who might be the most important or who might be most manifest the features of the empire. So we will have a comparison in that form. And furthermore, it's also styled, I named it, um, kind of focus on the rise and fall of empires. I have here a copy of Gibbons, the uh, volume one of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. I have the um, remaining five volumes back in British Columbia as well. And sort of the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, I think, influenced the rise and fall of the Third Reich, written by Shearer, and um, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire is by Gibbons. But nonetheless, what, what I'm hoping to learn from this and through all these empires is what sort of caused the decline of these empires. So I'm trying to focus on the, the rise and the fall of each respective empire. So nonetheless, and I think the takeaway, and maybe I'll learn more, and perhaps you might learn more as we progress throughout this series of what causes empires to fall. I think even Gibbons, of course, I have not entirely finished the all six volumes of Gibbons' um, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, but the point is there is not one definite cause that causes an empire to fall, usually, and we might see quite differently. However, like the Roman Empire declined over many years, so there will not be usually one, and so far not in these two, one specific reason as to why these fall, but nonetheless, that is the shape. So we have two empires, uh, rise and fall of each empire, two major leaders, and a comparison at the end. So I hope you enjoyed this, and last but not least, this title is named after Age of Empires, which was a, a game I used to like to play when I was young. I got it from my granny when I was young, and I have a soft place in my heart for that name, so I thought it would be fitting. So without further ado, we will begin with Khufu, also known as Cheops of the Old Kingdom of Egypt Empire, and we will continue to Gudea of the Lagash Empire. So, uh, in terms of the rise and fall of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. So, the Old Kingdom of Egypt, also known as um, the Age of Pyramids, represents a pivotal period in ancient Egyptian history. It spanned from approximately 2686 BCE to 2181 BCE, and witnessed the emergence of the centralized state monumental architectural achievements, and a flourishing of cultural and artistic endeavors. The pro we, um, therefore, we will continue to provide some detailed exploration as to the rise and eventual decline of the Old Kingdom, encompassing its political, social, economic, and cultural dimensions. So starting with the emergence of the Old Kingdom of Egypt, around circa 3100 to 2686 BCE, so starting with the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. So the origins of the Old Kingdom can be traced back to the early dynastic period, circa 3100, as mentioned, to 2686 BCE. And to that, so this is sort of the period before the empire that caused, um, that led up to it, as we noted that it started uh, 2686 BC but this is 3,100 up to 2,686 BCE. And for anyone who doesn't know, in the BCE, is it, it goes in reverse chronological order, so bigger numbers are further from um, zero. And, and so this was a time of pol political consolidation and cultural development. 
Narmer, who is often identified as the first pharaoh, is credited with unifying upper and lower regions of Egypt around 3100 BCE, marking the dawn of this dynastic era. So the sort of the groundwork that led up to the old kingdom of Egypt is this Narmer figure who was the first pharaoh who united upper and lower Egypt. So moving to the some details regarding the dynastic system, so with Narmer's unification, a dynastic system was established where power was inherited within a ruling family. Pharaohs were revered as living gods, wielding immense political and religious authority. So in terms of the political structure, so there was the di divine pharaoh, and at the, so therefore at the apex of the political hierarchy stood the pharaoh who was considered a living deity on earth, as mentioned, and this divine status was emphasized through elaborate rituals, monumental constructions, and the close association with gods. In terms of the bureaucracy under him, so to manage the sprawling empire, a sophisticated bureaucratic apparatus was developed. Viziers, high-ranking officials, oversaw various administrative functions, including taxation, justice, and public works. This bureaucracy played a vital role in maintaining st stability and efficiency. In terms of the pol uh, provincial administration, Egypt was divided into provinces called gnomes, each governed by a nomarch appointed by the pharaoh. These nomarchs ensured local governance, collected taxes, and maintained order within their respective territories. Moving to economic foundations, so starting with agricultural prosperity, the fertile Nile Delta and Nile Valley formed the heartland of ancient Egypt. It advanced irrigation techniques and the annual inundation of the Nile ensured bountiful harvests of crops like wheat, barley, and flax. This agricultural surplus sustained the population and supported large-scale construction projects. In terms of trade networks, with largely self-sufficient, uh, while largely self-sufficient, pardon me, Egypt engaged in trade with neighboring regions. Valuable resources like gold, ebony, and cedar were imported, enriching the empire and fostering cultural exchange. So it's, it's interesting, even this earliest empire was already engaged in trade. Moving to labor and the corvée system. So a significant portion of the population participated in labor-intensive endeavors such as constructing pyramids, temples, and maintaining the irrigation systems. The corvée system compelled system citizens to contribute their labor to public works during periods of low agricultural activity. So sort of a forced labor um, while the, in the off-seasons of harvest, for example. Moving to religious beliefs and cosmology. So it was polythe in terms of polytheism and div the divine pantheon. So ancient Egyptians practiced a polytheistic religion, meaning many gods, and venerating a diverse pantheon of gods and goddesses. Each deity represented various natural el elements, cosmic forces, and aspects of human existence. Using to funerary beliefs and afterlife, so funeral beliefs and afterlife, central Egyptian religious beliefs w was a concept of an central to their beliefs was the concept of an afterlife. It was believed that a virtuous life led to passage into the field of reeds, a paradise-like realm. Elaborate tombs, burial practices, and offerings were devised to ensure a successful transition to the afterlife, as you see the famous mummies and mummification processes. In terms of the rise of raw and solar theology, during the latter stages of the during the later stages of the Old Kingdom, the worship of Ra, the sun god, gained prominence. So sort of, as we see in, uh, we might see, but as I sort of observe, many polytheist, polytheistic societies move towards a monotheism and sort of find a leader amongst the pantheon, think of perhaps Zeus or Horus, for example. So Ra was considered the supreme deity, or became so, embodying the life-giving force of the sun and was closely associated with kingship and power. Moving to the architectural marbles of the old Egyptian empire, so starting with the pyramids, the hallmark of the old kingdom egg architecture is the construction of pyramids. These colossal tombs, most notably those at Giza, were built to honor and house the remains of pharaohs. They served as a physical link between the earthly realms and the afterlife. It's interesting in the in 
Herodotus, he notes in the, the histories, which I'm, I'm reading, it's one of the oldest books of history of all time, he notes that there was this labyrinth that he said equaled or surpassed in greatness the Great Pyramid of Giza. So um, it doesn't exist today, but I can only imagine apparently there were tw it was based on 12 massive chambers and unless someone had the, the map they would get absolutely lost. So sad that it no longer exists and the pyramid was, in my opinion, and I think most agree, the greatest structure for thousands and thousands of years. So I can only imagine how great that the, the, the labyrinth must have been. So moving to mortuary temples and complexes. So complexes, this, so this would be put below, but um, no longer exists, but perhaps the labyrinth might have even been superior to the Great Pyramid of Giza or all other pyramids as well. So adjacent to the pyramids, mortuary temples were constructed to honor deceased pharaohs. These temples were focal points to elaborate rituals, offerings, and ceremonies aimed at ensuring the pharaoh's eternal well-being. Moving to mastabas and tombs, so while pyramids were reserved for pharaohs, lesser notables were interred in matabases. These flat-roofed rectangular structures also contained burial chambers and offered an offerings for afterlife. So there is very significant focus on the afterlife and all their, well not all their structures, but many of their most important structures. So moving to the decline and transition as alluded to. So starting with environmental challenges. Toward the latter part, or the yes, the latter part of the Old Kingdom, a confluence of environmental factors, including prolonged droughts, disrupted stability of the empire, and, um, including prolonged droughts, disrupted the stability of the empire. This led to economic strain, social unrest, and weakening central authority. Moving to continuing on to the erosion of central control, as the central government's influence waned. Provincial governors began to assert more autonomy, so sort of uh, powers being taken away from the center and being sort of going up to the nomarchs. These period witnessed, uh, this period witnessed a rise of local rulers, contributing to the fragmentation of the empire. So moving to the first intermediate period from 2181 to 2055 BCE, so going to beyond sort of the past, past in, into the the sort of ending period of the Old Kingdom of Egypt Empire. So the weakening of the Old Kingdom ultimately led to its collapse, marking the onset of the First Intermediate Period. This era was characterized by political fragmentation, economic decline, and stagnation of cultural achievements. So of course the decline of Egypt cannot be um, attributed to only one factor, but my takeaway here is that the, probably the main cause would be economic decline that led to um, loss of the central government and therefore led to this intermediate period where it was no longer the old kingdom of Egypt or, and also the, which was the greatest at its time. So in terms of a brief conclusion, so the old kingdom of Egypt remains an enduring testament of the grandeur and sophistication of ancient Egyptian civilization. From awe-inspiring pyramids to intricate administrative systems, this period laid the foundation for much of what defines Egyptian culture. While it eventually succumbed to environmental challenges and internal fragmentation, the legacy of the Old Kingdom continued to shape the course of Egyptian history for millennia to come. So, Egypt did not disappear, Egypt is still a country today, but the Old Kingdom of Egypt Empire which was the greatest at its time, did decline and was, and as we'll see, there was a new uh, greatest empire in town, which was Lagash, perhaps. So, a little biography of Khufu. So Khufu sort of identified as probably the most prominent or most significant of the pharaohs, of the leaders. So he's often, he can be titled the visionary pharaoh of the old kingdom. So in terms of introduction, Khufu was also known as Cheops, and that's how he's referred to in Herodotus' histories, stands as one of the most formidable figures in ancient Egyptian history. He reigned during the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom around 2589 to 2566 BCE, so sort of at the height of the Old Kingdom of Egypt's power. And Khufu's legacy is etched in the monumental pyramids at Giza, so probably the most significant achievement lasting today, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, particularly the Great Pyramid, which, consi which is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and probably um, 
uh, well, maybe even the greatest, but nonetheless, that's up to debate. And that, um, therefore, we will now delve into the life and accomplishments of Khufu, exploring his reign, architectural achievements, religious contributions, and the enduring impact that he left on Egypt and the world. So starting with his early life and ascension to the throne, so in terms of his lineage, he was born into the royal family, as we alluded to earlier, being the son of Sneferu, the founder of the fourth dynasty. This lineage afforded him privileged, uh, priv privileged upbringing and education, preparing him for his future role as pharaoh. So starting with the transition of power upon his father's death, Khufu ascended the throne, inheriting a kingdom that was already marked by grand architectural projects and a flourishing economy. In terms of his reign, so centralized authority and government, governance, Khufu's reign was characterized by a strong central authority. He maintained a well-organized bureaucracy with viziers and high-ranking officials overseeing various administrative functions. This contrib contributed to the stability and efficiency of his rule. In terms of economic prosperity and trade, under Khufu's rule, Egypt experienced economic prosperity, as alluded to. The Nile Delta and Valley were meticulously cultivated, yielding abundant harvests. Additionally, Khufu facilitated trade networks, further enriching the empire with resources and cultural exchange. So he was definitely open to trade. And as we might see, not all leaders are necessarily open to trade. Some of them tend to focus on nationalism or sort of closing off borders. So Khufu was actually different, but perhaps because he was secure in his position, because he was absolute leader in a thriving economy and the most powerful empire at the time. In terms of his architectural ambitions, starting with the Great Pyramid of Giza, as mentioned previously, so Khufu's most enduring legacy is undoubtedly the construction of the Great Pyramid, also known as the Pyramid of Khufu. Standing at over 480 feet tall, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world for thousands of years. The precision and scale of this architectural marvel remain a testament of, to Khufu's vision and an engineering prowess of ancient Egypt. So perhaps maybe even the greatest structure of all time. Um, perhaps this uh, labyrinth alluded to might have been greater, but it doesn't exist anymore. However, they found the site of it, and but nonetheless, this cannot be proved other than in Herodotus's history. Other architectural achievements, uh, endeavors, pardon me, in addition to the Great Pyramid, Khufu commissioned several other projects, including pyramids for his queens and mortuary temples. These structures, while not as massive as the Great Pyramid, demonstrated his commitment to honoring the deceased and perpetuating his legacy. Moving to his religious contributions and beliefs, starting with his patronage to the sun god Ra, as we mentioned, he sort of became, oh, did ultimately become the leader of the pantheon of gods. Khufu's reign witnessed a significant emphasis on the cult of Ra, so perhaps he was one of the leading causes into this focus on Ra, the sun god. Ra was associated with kingship, power, and life-giving forces of the sun. Khufu's patronage to Ra solidified the deity's promise to in the, uh, prominence in Egyptian religious practices. So another key reason as to why Khufu might be the most significant leader in the old kingdom of Egypt empire. Moving to his funerary beliefs and practices, Khufu's religious beliefs were deeply intertwined with funeral practices. He ensured that the necessary rituals, offerings, and provisions were made to secure his eternal well-being in the afterlife. But this also had implications on society as well. So if they see, oh, the pharaoh is very concerned about his afterlife, he's building all these temples, and so to, uh, has an effect on all other people in ancient, the old kingdom of Egypt empire. To his legacy and impact, his enduring architectural marvels, as alluded to, Khufu's architectural achievements, particularly the Great Pyramid, continue to captivate and inspire all to this day. They stand as a testament to the ingenuity and skill of the ancient Egyptian engineers and builders. Moving to cultural and historical significance, Khufu's reign marked a high point in the Old Kingdom's cultural and artistic achievements. The grandeur and sophistication of his projects set a standard for future generation of Egyptian rulers. So also, the following rulers followed him, but none surpassed him in greatness of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So this, there's a uh, Graham Hancock, who I, I find very fascinating. Um, so investigative journalist, but I'd also consider him a scholar. He notes that, I believe it's in Turkey, there is this 
these uh, sites and they get smaller and smaller over time, which is kind of contrary to how one might think civilizations would, would develop. You'd think they'd get bigger and bigger, but the Great Pyramid of Giza was done under Khufu, and that might mark perhaps where the one of the turning points into the decline of the old Kingdom of Egypt Empire, because they never built a bigger pyramid at least, so that's one um, indication. In terms of the influence on, on or, uh, his cultural and historical significance, uh, no, actually, pardon me, to the influence and successive dynasties, the legacy of Khufu transcended his own era, influencing religious and architectural practices of subsequent dynasties. His architectural innovations became a template for later pyramid constructions, but albeit not as big as his. So in terms of conclusion, Khufu, the visionary pharaoh of the Old Kingdom, left an indelible mark on the ancient Egyptian history. His reign was marked by grandeur, ambition, and dedication to honoring the divine. Through the enduring legacy of the Great Pyramid and other architectural marvels, Khufu's contribution continued to be celebrated, reminding the world of the remarkable achievements of ancient Egypt and its visionary rulers. So there's a, a quote I'm um, probably one of the uh, more um, controversial writers, um, Houston Chamberlain, but he wrote that once you know one pharaoh, you know all of them. That's, I think, a, a too broad a statement. They are certainly different. I think Khufu is the greatest. But the thing is, they, they, they un, were, contrary to other rulers, were more similar than they were different. They were sort of all absolute rulers. They, um, they all had, they were all focused on, predominantly focused on architecture. So they were more similar than different. And that's, um, but nonetheless, I decided that Khufu would be the most important because he did the Great Pyramid of Giza and sort of also caused this centralization of gods towards Ra as well. And he was also open to trade, which also manifested one of the differentiating features of the Old Kingdom of Egypt. So we will discuss quickly the content of the slide that I prepared here before moving to the Lagash Empire and then to Gudea. And then we'll again have a comparison with Gudea and Khufu. So we'll go back to Khufu a little, in a little bit. So uh, the significant leader, Khufu, also known as Cheops in Herodotus's history. The empire is the old kingdom of Egypt. The period is circa 2686 to 2181 BCE. It's 0 0.1 million square kilometers or 0 0.15 million square miles. Therefore, about 0.3% of the world. That's excluding the, uh, Antarctica. So that's actually very, uh, very large. Some of the leading empires of the world did not surpass that size. So we'll see Lagash did become a leading empire, but not nearly as large as that. Capital city, Memphis, pardon me, I wrote that twice. Government, divine, absolute monarchy, common languages, ancient Egyptian, religion, ancient Egyptian religion, population 1.6 million, and that was in 2500 BCE, so that is really quite massive for, um, for the time, I would think. And even today, 1.6 million is really quite massive. And the first leader is J Djoser. The, and the last leader, there's a debate. Some say it's either Nekokwerdi Sipta in the 6th dynasty or Neferirker in the 7th or 8th dynasty. It's also, in the title, we have Khufu, Cheops, and the Old Kingdom of Egypt Empire. It's titled The Age of Pyramids. In the top left, we have a picture of Khufu or Cheops. And next to that, slightly to the right, we have a picture of many of the pyramids of Giza. To the right of that, the Great Sphinx and Great Pyramid of Giza. In the top right, we have the Pyramid of Djoser, who was the first uh, pharaoh of this uh, great king of the old kingdom of Egypt at Saqqara. And below that, we have the Temple of Djoser at Saqqara. So it's interesting that the first leader at some of the um, most long-lasting sites. Below, below that, we have an unnamed king. However, it's supposedly very significant. Um, to the left of that, we have Khufu's horse name, Medjudu, um, written in their old hieroglyphs. And to the left of that, we have Menkor and Hathor and Anput, so some famous figures and cast in, I believe that would be bronze, but I'm not exactly sure. So thank, um, thank you for listening to this um, biography and history, and now we will continue to the Lagash Empire before we will talk a little bit more about Khufu in a comparison with Gudea. The most prominent leader of, of the Lagash Empire. So in terms of the rise and fall of the Lagash Empire, so, so the introduction, the Lagash Empire, also known as the Kingdom of Lagash, was a prominent city-state in ancient Mesopotamia. 
It emerged around 2500 BC and played a crucial role in the development of early Mesopotamian society. This uh, we will seek to provide a comprehensive overview of the rise and eventual decline of the Lagash Empire, encompassing its political, economic system, cultural achievements, and the factors that led to its eventual fall. So starting with its early foundations, circa 2500 to 2300 BCE, so starting with its geographic context, the city of Lagash was located in the fertile plains of southern Mesopotamia, near Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Its strategic location allowed it to thrive agriculturally and facilitated trade with its neighboring city-states, two things that were key to the success of the old Egyptian empire, as we saw. Moving to the emergence of city-states, so during this period, ancient Mesopotamia was comprised of numerous independent city-states, each ruled by its own king, or Ensi. Lagash, under the leadership of figures like Enmetana and Lugulanda, gradually gained prominence. So kind of as one might see in ancient Greece, where Athens so slowly became the leading city-state in that region, or at least in Ionia. And there's also the whole history of um, Thucydides, the, the war between Sparta and Athens, so it wasn't always the absolute dominant, there's been different dominance, but nonetheless, this is kind of a, a feature we see in Lagash, where Lagash gradually became, and up to this period, became the dominant empire of the world. So moving to the political structure, so starting with the NC and Lugal, so the ruler of Lagash held the title of NC. As the city's power and territorial influence expanded, some rulers adopted the title of Lugal, indicating a higher rank and dominance over other city-states. So starting with the NC, they needed someone who was above other city-states, and therefore they created this new title, Lugal. So starting with the code, or continuing to the code of Urakagina, Urakajina, a notable ruler of Lagash, implemented a code of laws that aimed to regulate various aspects of society, including property rights, marriage, and commerce. This code reflects an early attempt at legal governance. So, as these two are the oldest um, empires that we will be covering, and these are the oldest empires that I am part of, even Summer, as there's Graham Hancock says, um, he quotes another book um, by a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, history begins with summer. Well, even in this series, we've got two older empires, but nonetheless, there were civilizations before, but these are the oldest empires on, uh, according to my research. So this uh, is the oldest legal code that we have access to, but perhaps there was, must have been the legal laws as well in the old kingdom of Egypt too, and societies before that. So, but nonetheless, it's one of the earliest attempts at legal governance and Perhaps we can call it the earliest. Moving to the economic foundations, starting with agriculture and irrigation. So the economy of Lagash was primarily agrarian, relying on the fertile soil of southern Mesopotamia. Advanced irrigation techniques were developed to maximize agricultural productivity, ensuring a steady food supply. Moving to trade and commerce, Lagash engaged in trade with, both within Mesopotamia and with distant regions. The city-state's access to waterways facilitated the exchange of goods, including textiles, metals, and agricultural products, similar um, benefits that the Old Kingdom of Egypt also benefited from. Moving to tri the tribute and taxation, so as Lagash expanded its territory, it imposed tribute on conquered cities and collected taxes from its subjects. This revenue was crucial to funding military campaigns and maintaining the city's infrastructures. So once again, we see parallels with Athens, where they have taxation on the other city-states as well, and particularly in Ionia. Obviously, it varied over time, but that was a common theme throughout the history of Athens. Moving to the cultural achievements of the Lagash Empire, starting with art and agriculture, or pardon me, art and architecture. Lagash was renowned for its architectural achievements, including ziggurats, temples, and palaces. These structures were not only functional, but also served as symbols of the city-state's prestige and religious devotion. The Steel of the Vultures, one of the most significant cultural artifacts of Lagash is the Steel of the Vultures, a carved stone monument, monument commemorating a military victory over the neighboring city of Uma. It provides valuable insights into the art, warfare, and religious beliefs of the time. 
moving to literature and cuneiform writing, Lagash, like other Mesopotamian city-states, contributed to the development of cuneiform writing. Literary compositions such as hymns, myths, and legal texts were recorded on clay tablets, preserving the cultural and legal heritage of the empire. So now moving to the conflict and decline, circa 2000 to 2100 BCE, or pardon me, 2300 to 2100 BCE. So starting with the conflict with Uma, so they, so as they had one of their key sites was to commemorate a war with Uma. Just the, also long going conflict with Uma, one of the city states. So one of the key challenges faced by Lagash was its ongoing territorial dispute with the neighboring city state of Uma. This conflict was known as the Border Wars and sustained the resources and stability of both empires, sort of like Athens and Sparta perhaps. The Akkadian Empire and Sargon of Akkad. So the rise of Sargon of Akkad and the establishment of the Akkadian Empire posed a formidable threat to Lagash as well. Sargon's conquest led to the subjugation of Lagash and its incorporation into the, Lake, the Akkadian Empire, which we will uh, cover in future episodes. In terms of the legacy and so those are that's the, basically unlike the uh, Egyptian Empire, which was, uh, but there were probably also environmental factors too. But as far as I can see, the large predominant reasons for the decline of the Lagash Empire were through feuds with the. Uh, uh, Uma, and then later the Akkadian Empire, which came to uh, to encompass it, and also, so I guess perhaps maybe the takeaway is its resources weren't alone to su sustain it, so it engaged in taxation, but of course taxation upsets other city states, and nonetheless it wasn't it wasn't sustainable, unlike the old kingdom of Egypt, which was covered a, a larger, uh, at least a larger population, and uh, um, a larger area was perhaps uh, better suited to or more self-sufficient and didn't require wasn't as uh, didn't, didn't require to go to war as Lagash did so that's one key difference between the two empires so moving to the legacy and impact so the influence on the Mesopotamian civilization so the achievements of Lagash particularly in the realms of law as mentioned in one of the earliest codes governance and architecture left a lasting imprint on the broader Mesopotamian civilization. Many of its innovations and cultural contributions continued to shape the region for centuries. Moving to the, to the end, the revival of Gudea. Following the fall of Lagash, the city experienced a brief revival under Gudea, who we will now cover very soon, who emphasized religious devotion and a temple construction. While Lagash never regained its former prominence, Judea's efforts demonstrated a resilience and cultural continuity. So that's why we'll consider him probably the most significant leader and very different perhaps from um, Khufu, who was part of, in, as we'll, we'll get into this more later, but he was at the pinnacle of, um, of the old kingdom of Egypt, whereas Judea sort of came after, but sort of manifested the qualities of the Lagash Empire. So in conclusion, the rise and fall of the Lagash Empire marked a significant chapter in the annals of ancient Mesopotamian history. From its earliest foundations as a city-state its, to its prominence as a regional power, Lagash contributed significantly to the cultural, political, and economic landscape of the time. Despite its eventual decline, the legacy of Lagash endures in the cultural achievements and legal innovations that continue to shape our understanding of early Mesopotamian civilization. And uh, uh, I think it would be wrong to admit it also had influences on the rest of the world to just firstly by virtue of when it being the, the second oldest empire that we will be covering and that I can find that and therefore it has a massive massive influence just over time even one thing tiny thing butterfly effect I would say so moving to Gudea the who I consider to be the most significant leader um, in a couple of manifesting the qualities of Lagash, because it came slightly later, but nonetheless, Lagash, the pious ruler and architectural visionary. Starting with a brief introduction, the Gidea of Lagash, a prominent ruler of Mesopotamia, emerged as a beacon of cultural and religious revival during the tumultuous period of the region's history. His reign, which spanned from approximately 2144 BCE to 2124 BCE, left an indelible mark of the Lagash Empire. We will therefore delve into the life, accomplishments, and enduring legacy of Gudea, shedding light on his religious devotion, architectural achievements, and the profound impact he had on Mesopotamian civilization. 
so starting with his early life and extinction, the ancestry of Gudea. Gudea hailed from a noble lineage in Lagash, known for its piety and reverence to the gods. His family heritage endowed him with a deep sense of religious duty from an early age. So, to his ascension to the throne, Gudea ascended to the throne at a pivotal moment in the history of Lagash. Following a period of political instability, his ascension was greeted with anticipation as the people of Lagash sought a leader who could restore stability and reaffirm their religious convictions. So therefore, moving to his religious devotion and piety, the cult of Ningirsu. Gudea was a devout follower of the god Ningirsu, a patron de deity of Lagash. His reign was characterized by a fervent de dedication to the temple complex of Ningirsu, exemplifying his unwavering piety. Moving to the inscriptions and devotional practices, Gudea left behind a rich corpus of inscriptions known as the Gudea Cylinders, which detail his religious beliefs, devotions, and the construction projects he undertook in honor of Ningirsu. These inscriptions serve as a primary source for understanding his religious fervor. Moving to his architectural achievements, the temple complex of Ningirsu, Gudea's most enduring legacy lies in his extensive construction projects dedicated to Ningirsu. He commissioned the rebuilding of the temple complex, including I Ninu, the primary temple of the city, and I Dublma, uh, Dublalma, a secondary temple as well, but also very great in its own right. Following the Ziggurat and Girsu, Gudea's architectural endeavors extended to the construction of Ziggurat of Girsu, a monumental step tower that served as a physical manifestation of the connection between the earthly realms and the divine. Artistic representation, Gudea's statues, carved from high quality diorite, portray him in a postural in posture of prayer and devotion, emphasizing his piety and humility before the gods. These statues serve both as religious and propagandistic purposes, asserting his divine mandate to rule. As we'll see, um, parallels to Khufu. Moving to cultural and economic stewardship, patronage of the arts. Under Gudea's patronage, Lagash experienced a renaissance of art and culture. Artists and craftsmen flourished, creating intricate works that adorned the temples and celebrated the gods. Moving to his economic policies, Gudea's reign witnessed stability and prosperity in Lagash. He implemented policies that supported agricultural production and trade, ensuring a steady flow of resources for his ambition, ambitious construction projects. Moving to his diplomacy and foreign relations, starting with his interaction with foreign powers, Gudea's reign was marked by diplomatic engagements with neighboring city-states, including those within the emerging Akkadian Empire, which would come to, to, um, to rule over Lagash. These interactions were characterized by a delicate balance of asserting Lagash's independence while avoiding conflict. Moving to his legacy and impact, his religious continuity, Gudea's fervent devotion to Ningirsu and his monumental architectural project established a religious and cultural foundation that endured long after his reign. The temple complex he built became a center of religious pilgrimage for generations to come. Its influence on later generations, the artistic and architectural innovations introduced by Gudea influenced subsequent generations of rulers in Mesopotamia. His legacy was woven into a broader cultural fabric of the region. Therefore, in brief conclusion, Gudea of Lagash, a ruler for, uh, known for his unwavering religious devotion and architectural achievements, left an indelible mark on the history of ancient Mesopotamia. His reign epitomized a cultural and religious revival during a period of religion of regional upheaval. Through his piety, visionary construction projects, and enduring influence, Gudea's legacy continues to be celebrated as a testament to the profound impact that a dedicated and visionary ruler can have on a civilization. So, sort of a bright star during the decline and almost the, to the final years of the Lagash Empire. So we'll briefly go over the content of this slide, and then we'll continue a little bit more about Gudea in comparison with um, with uh, Khufu or Cheops also. So significant leader, the Gudea Empire, Lagash Empire, period circa 2500 to 2100 BCE, 0 0.05 million square kilometers or 0 0.02 million square kilometers, which amounts to about 0 0.04 percent. 0.04% of the world, 0.04% of the world, capital city, uh, pardon me, Memphis should not be there, capital city is Lagash, government, 
monarchy ruled by king or NC with Lugal ruling over other city-states, so Lugal above the ensign. Common languages, Sumerian. Religion, the god Ningirsu. Population tends to hundreds of thousands, so no precise, I couldn't find a precise estimate as to the population, so it could be tens of thousands, which is rather small kind of smaller to hundreds of thousands, which is quite large, but nonetheless smaller than the old kingdom of Egypt, then both in terms of size and population. And the region is Mesopotamia, which is in modern day Iraq. In terms of the image in the top left, we have the image of Gudea in his seated position. Next to that, to the right, we have Anzu, the symbol of Lagash, which is the sort of winged like figure. To the um, we have a couple other unnamed images here, but they're often sort of maybe where they differ from the old kingdom of Egypt is that this one to the right is focused on battles, war. They obviously had bows at this time. Uh, to down and to the left of that, we have an image of a man, unknown man, but to the right one may get an idea for what they looked like at the time. To the right, we have a vase, which was made at the time. Amazing that it lasted today. Below that we have ruins. As you can see, the, the ground is really not fertile there, so too, perhaps I, that might have been one of the causes of the decline of the kingdom of Gash, uh, like it was with the old kingdom of Egypt, but I have not seen that specifically referenced. But nonetheless, it does not look overly fertile today. To the right, we have the name of Lagash, written in their hieroglyphs. I'm not sure if they're also called hieroglyphs, but written in their writing. In the top right, we have a relief of Bir Nash, which is, um, you know, shows some of their art at the time, which is a very, really quite phenomenal, considering this is over 4,000 years ago. Below that, we have Iyanatum, Iyanatum, one of the kings of Lagash. And below that, we have a vase of Gid Gishakidu, king of Uma, which was the one of the enemies of or well, of Lagash. They fought for many years and in some ways were one of the causes of the decline or the fall of the Lagash Empire. So now we will move to a comparison between Gudea, Khufu, and Gudea and the style of Plutarch's lives to hopefully maybe learn a little bit more about both the leaders and by effect maybe the two empires. So Khufu of the Old Kingdom of Egypt and Gudea of the Old Kingdom of Lagash were two eminent rulers of ancient times who exerted their influence in distinct regions, Egypt and Mesopotamia respectively. Although separated by geography, they share a distinction of being celebrated leaders in their respective civilizations. This compare up oh, so therefore we will um, this comparison will explore the various facets of their reigns, including their historical context political structures, religious beliefs, architectural endeavors, cultural contributions, and e con enduring legacies. So starting with their historical context, Khufu, with Khufu of Egypt, so it was Aaron Dynasty, Khufu also known as Cheops, reigned during the fourth dynasty of the old kingdom of Egypt around 2589 BCE to 2566 BCE. This period is characterized as the peak in ancient Egyptian civilization known for its monumental architectural projects. Moving to Gudea of Lagash, his era and city-state context, Gudea governed the independent city-state of Lagash located in ancient Mesopotamia approximately from 2144 BCE to 2124 BCE, so after uh, Gudea, as hence that's why the, we covered the Lagash Empire after. And Mesopotamia was uh, was a region comprising independent city-states, each with its own ruler and unique po political system. However, Gudea had powers over some of the other city-states. But as alluded to earlier, uh, Khufu reigned at the peak of the old Egyptian empire. However, Gudea was sort of um, it was a, a shining light near the the latter period of the Lagash Empire. In terms of political structure, starting with Khufu of Egypt, it had a centralized monarchy. Khufu ruled over a highly centralized state with a complex administrative structure consisting of viziers, governors, and officials responsible for various aspects of governance. Moving to Gudea of Lagash, the city-state governance, Gudea's rule was confined to the city-state of Lagash, where he exercised authority over local officials. However, they did have taxation on other city-states, but maybe not necessarily during Gudea's time, because that was sort of one of the latter periods where it sort of started to lose its grip over those other city-states. The Mesopotamian city-states operated within a more decentralized political framework compared to the centralized rule of the Egyptian pharaohs, so relatively less centralized, which might have caused it 
been one of the causes of its decline because the old kingdom of Egypt declined due to its decline in centralization, and Lagash never had the level of centralization that the old kingdom of Egypt did, or at least it did under Khufu. The religious beliefs and practices, Khufu of Egypt was a divine ruler in ancient Egyptian belief. The pharaoh, including Khufu, was regarded as a living god on earth, acting as a bridge between the mortal and divine realms. In terms of Gudea of Lagash, he had a devotion to Ningirsu, who, um, Ningirsu, who uh, was a devout um, follower of Ningirsu, uh, the patron deity of Lagash. His reign was marked by intense religious piety and devotion to the gods. So, but I might note that um, Khufu was uh, sort of led to the rise of Ra, whereas Gudea led to the rise of Ningirsu. So it's similar in that they both sort of brought a prominent god to both of their respective empires. In terms of their architectural achievements, which they both have many, starting with Khufu of Egypt, the Great Pyramid. Khufu's most renowned architectural feat is the Great Pyramid of Giza, a colossal structure built with massive limestone blocks serving as his tomb. Moving to Gudea of Lagash, the temple complex at Ningirsu. Gudea's primary architectural legacy lies in the renovation and reconstruction of a temple complex dedicated to Ningirsu, including the Eni and Ma temples. These temples were crucial centers of religious activity in Lagash. But I might note that Khufu's was more of a restoration project, whereas Khufu's was sort of um, it was his. Um, his pyramid, it was his idea, um, and uh, I would say Khufu's is a little grander, but nonetheless, you know, th that doesn't mean Kudai was less great of a leader, because so he actually managed to change the momentum of Lagash, whereas Khufu sort of took advantage of the already growing momentum, and in fact, no one managed to surpass, well, no one managed to surpass either of these, so that is something, either of these leaders, which is something both of them have in common. Moving to their cultural and economic contributions, starting with Khufu of Egypt, his patronage to the arts. Khufu's reign witnessed the flourishing and artistic cultural achievements. Skilled craftsmen created intricate works that adorned temples and celebrated the gods. Moving to Gidea of Lagash, religious revival. Gidea's intense religious devotion and extensive temple construction projects had a profound impact on the religious landscape of Lagash, revitalizing the city's religious traditions. So something that was both their rules sort of depended on was building these sites to sort of strengthen one's belief in the gods and therefore their own power, but also it had caused other people to create projects in Gibbons the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He notes that it wasn't just the emperors who were building all the great, great um, uh, structures in the Roman Empire, but many other patrons, wealthy patrons, built them also, not even because the emperors told them to, but because of their pride in the Roman Empire. So, and this pride, perhaps, in both of these empires here, under Khufu's and Gudea's, was due to their being inspired by these two respective leaders. Moving to legacy and impact, Khufu, starting with Khufu of Egypt, his enduring legacy, Khufu's architectural legacy, especially the Great Pyramid, remains an iconic symbol of the ancient Egyptian civilization's grandeur and technical prowess. Moving to Gudea of Lagash, his religious and architectural influence, Gudea's profound religious devotion and extensive temple construction product projects influenced later generations of rulers of Mesopotamia, setting the standard for temple construction. So both of them are probably above all uh, most known for their architecture, so that is something they have in common. But secondly, I would say for their religious, or maybe primarily, but both, I would say architecture and religion were probably the two most important factors, uh, the commonalities between them, and they both um, influenced future generations significantly. Where they might differ is that Khufu was probably more open to trade because perhaps he had the biggest state, whereas Gudea seemed to have more conflicts with the neighboring city-states, such as Uma. So in conclusion, Khufu of the Old Kingdom of Egypt and Gudea of the Old Kingdom of Lagash were remarkable leaders who, despite the geographical and cultural differences of their respective realms, both left indelible marks on their civilizations. Khufu's architectural marvel, the Great Pyramid of Giza, symbolizes the grandeur of ancient Egyptian civilization, while Gudea's religious fervor and extensive temple construction projects revitalized Lagash's religious traditions and influenced later Mesopotamian rulers. Their reigns and accomplishments continue to be celebrated as testaments to the remarkable achievements of their respective civilizations. So, 
that is the two leaders. I think they're both great in their own right. They perhaps, perhaps, Gudea could have been better if he was in Khufu's position, and perhaps Khufu would have underperformed if he were in Gudea's position, or would have just continued the decline. So that um, that is impossible to determine. But nonetheless, both achieved some very, very great things that um, caused both of their empires to be the greatest at their respective times. So thank you very much for watching this first episode on Ages of Empire on the Old Kingdom of Egypt and the Lagash Empire. And this is Cashcrop TV, and I hope you continue to support. Thank you so much.